So since the killing of George Floyd in late May, uh, the city of Portland has seen night after night after night of protests. We're talking, uh, you know, 56 plus nights. Some of them, some of those protests have been pretty violent as well. But in recent days, the focus has turned to federal law enforcement agencies that the Trump administration has deployed to the Pacific Northwest city. There are major concerns surrounding the move after some agents have been caught on camera tear gassing and physically accosting peaceful observers and journalists as well, as carrying away protesters and placing them in unmarked vehicles. So I want to bring in Teresa Rayford. Uh, she is the founder of Don't Shoot Portland. Uh, Teresa, you're also a write-in candidate for the uh, mayoral election in November. And as I understand it, it's sort of completely organic. It's not you. It's that people support what you're saying and, and want to see your name on the ballot. Um, but let's talk about what is happening in your city, because most people around the country are going to see, you know, a minute and a half on the evening news, and it's going to be kind of the most extreme stuff. So you're on the ground. You've been on the ground every single day. What is the state of Portland right now? Uh, this, the state of Portland has been made into what you see on the news um, purely because of the propaganda and the acquiescence of our leaders in the city, um, rather than connect with the protesters when the initial uprisings began, um, they tried to compete and uh, basically infiltrate uh, the protests to create a co-opt for political agendas. And it's created more chaos because uh, one of the things is that we're not just seeing a black right, I mean, a upli uh, uprising of the Black Lives Matter movement against police violence and brutality, but we're seeing uh, uh, engagement because of the cri the crisis we're dealing with with the pandemic with COVID, um, we're pushing for mutual aid. We're looking for leadership to let us know that the inequities that were discussed before George Floyd's death that there's something that's being done, um, but we don't see that, um, and people are outraged. And the fact that our city policing um, through our mayor Ted Wheeler uh, first, I mean, they literally created the blueprint that were seen be played out by the federal agents that were sent by the Trump administration. Teresa, can you explain perhaps to the audience who may see these images, as Anne-Marie points out, um, that we're showing too, uh, and, and explain if there is a difference at all between people who want to see justice for George Floyd and who want to see an end to police brutality, who want to uh, see an end to the inequitable treatment under the law that African Americans have experienced for so many years, versus those who may have a political agenda, uh, who may seek to hijack uh, that movement. Um, because you got folks from the Trump administration saying that there are people that appear in the middle of the night dressed in black that don't appear to be at all interested in what happened to George Floyd that are sort of hijacking those protests, which then causes the federal government to use these tactics that some people are saying might even be ultimately unconstitutional. Well, the problem in Oregon is that we have a, a large body of white supremacists and white nationalist movements that are happening. And with people wearing our mask and with us still wanting to protest and stand up for our freedom of expression, um, we have no protection from our city leaders against those uh, harmful agents. And so when we see the people wearing black and everything else, they study our methods of, of protest and engagement. And they're benefiting from the, the scene of violence. They they use this stuff on their Twitches. They do, you know, live streams and they edit them. And in aid of the federal government, in aid of our local police, there's so many stories about you know white nationalists coming to our city and being protected by our local police force. And again, to fit the political agenda, they've shown up at our protests. People that have never shown up at our protests are showing up. And there's a lot of confusion because there's so much disinformation. Um, people that are showing up for George Floyd don't know about these white nationalists that are mixed in with the groups. And some of them are looking just, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell who's who. Um, and I think that the administration has taken advantage of that. And I think that our local leaders should have connected with on the ground protesters so that we could make sure that people that did want to exercise freely were not subjected to that type of uh, infiltration and harm. Um, because it does look really unbalanced and it does seem very seedy, but there is so much infiltration. We don't know Trump's agents and the collective partnerships he has with private contractors uh, from the nationalists because um, they're both black and white and they're soldiers with no badges. And 
uh, they look like us at times because we don't see them in uniform. And yeah, it's, it's just pretty chaotic. But at least it's just a couple of blocks in downtown Portland. It's not the entire city on siege. Um, and a lot of the people that you see mobilizing, like the white people, the moms, the medics, uh, they're coming down on the ground because they're already uh, providing mutual aid through our you know, community networks because of the pandemic. So now we're integrating our pandemic response um, along with the Black Lives Matter response so that we can provide security and safety. Um, can we talk a little bit more about just what you just said? I think a lot of people have this image of Portland. It may have changed sort of over the past few years, though, that it's like this sort of liberal-leaning, progressive um, city. And in many cases, it is. Um, there's only the population, only 3 percent African-American. But there's also this long history of discrimination. And, you know, it's not the first time we've seen sort of right-wing white nationalists descend on the city and participate in these protests. At the same time, you point out, you have all these other sort of diverse groups that are coming down as well. You talk about the moms and, and so on and so forth. So can you just sort of give us a little insight into the city of Portland that from a distance people may not realize the history that's there? Absolutely. Portland is severely flawed in regards to the propaganda uh, uh, the provision of equity and inclusion. Uh, the reason that the Black Lives Matter movement is so fortified in that city is because there is so much bigotry and discrimination against anyone who is not a white cis person. Um, the city was built on a utopia for, you know, people um, to have, like, their world, their white utopia, white landia. And even with shows like Portlandia, you could see that the whiteness is celebrated and is like it's an emotional attachment. And so when black lives matter or when disability lives matter or when LGBT lives matter, and then they become powerful because of their community engagement, um, there's a large resistance, not only from the bigots that live in our city and our state, but from the agencies that have provided them the sanctuary of kind of, uh, you know, criminalizing poverty and segregating community. I think Oregon was one of the first places that started calling black people uh, POC so that they could find ways to discriminate against us through policy um, and really promoting a lot of anti-blackness when they saw the centering of blackness in our city. So there is a large resistance against that by a younger generation that does not want the burden of that legacy. Teresa, can I um, continue uh, uh, to pivot off of what uh, you mentioned earlier and what Anne Marie is talking about? Um, given that you've said that you have seen uh, folks that are infiltrating the movement that are seeking to hijack uh, what you are doing to call attention to uh, police injustice and, and racial inequality, um, would it make sense, for example, I know a lot of people who are not uh, very plugged in to what is happening in places like Portland or, or in Minneapolis or even right here in New York City, say to themselves, well, you know, why do they have to do these protests at night? Why not just do them in the day? Why not have uh, big marches, big protests, big rallies that take place during the day and not do it in the dead of night when anything can happen and images can be taken and, uh, and used for political purposes. Is there any sense to perhaps keeping some of those white supremacists who you say are infiltrating the movement um, uh, you know, on their toes by changing the way you uh, deploy the folks who want to protest and uh, demand racial justice? Um, during the day, the white supremacists are riding through the streets with flags on the back of their trucks. They have no problem showing their stripes and their stars and their badges and their flags. Um, so the, the night thing is just basically people are congregating in the area where we're providing jail support. Um, since the uprising started, so many people have been um, arrested, um, people that have probably never protested before. And we have a history of providing uh, jail support right downtown in front of the Justice Center so that as people come out, we can provide them with transportation, medical support, clothing, food, if they need to be transferred from their housing because they've been doxxed by the police or the media. Um, we have to make sure that they have housing support. So that general space... Um, is being occupied for the support that's needed through mutual aid um, for the people that are being arrested or even people that have issues that they need addressed. 
Um, what is happening, though, is that the protests that are happening throughout the city from all the different designated uprisings um, that people are building through their own communities, they congregate downtown at the end of the day because that's where we see justice. And so that crowding down there is constant. It's not like just at night. It's a constant um, occupation in that space. And, you know, maybe because the people are down there talking to legal support and different things that are addressing the administrative need of the foundation for organizing. Um, maybe that's, you know, not being captured by the media, but yeah, they're, they're constantly there. We had a couple of days ago, the police at five in the morning uh, uprooted the entire camp and sprayed the barbecue grills from riot ribs. And, you know, were you know, literally spraying people in their tents and under their masks to get them out of the area before seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and that had never happened. So there is an escalation of tactics because they do see that there is a strong operation of organizing. So the night thing is just, is is yeah, it just happens. <laughs> that's uh, Sorry, good information, uh, Teresa Rayford. That, yeah, no, that's good context for us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Teresa Rayford, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.